du mela saubona sak passe namaste upshin dubra ota assalamu alaikum hotep bonus noches bonsoir welcome welcome to another episode of the lot carry wise digital couch my name is doria lanez larrier and i am here to be the host for this evening on behalf of the executive team which includes Dr. Gina M. Stewart, who is the president of Lot Carey, the Reverend Emmett L. Dunn, who's here tonight, who's the executive secretary treasurer, Dr. Jesse T. Williams Jr., who is the first vice president, Dr. James Victor, who is the second vice president, Dr. Angelita Clifton, who is the president of WISE, which is the Women in Service Everywhere, Reverend Dr. Brenda McBurrow, who is the first vice president, and Sister Lynette Richardson, who is the second vice president. We welcome you. First, let me begin by giving some uh, announcements. We are here at the top of the year. We are so blessed and highly favored to have our executive team and leadership of the Lot Carey Baptist Farm Mission Convention be our guests on our digital couch during this period, during this season. Some of the things that are coming up, because this is the first of the year, we want to let you know about a few things. First of all, you may have missed, but we don't want you to miss it come, moving forward. Every first day of the month at 6.30 a.m., we have a monthly prayer call. Now, that prayer call is not just a prayer call. We actually are going to have our executive team during this year provide the meditation every single day of the year. So that's the first of the year, 6.30 a.m. If you are a part of the Lot Carry uh, web. If you follow the Lot Carry website, if you're part of the Lot Carry Women in Service Everywhere Facebook page, then you will see the prompts, and we do look forward to you joining our call. Secondly, we will be having in March our annual session, and that is in Alexandria, Virginia. So March 16th and 17th. If you're not already a part of the know, please get in the know. If your church is not a part of Lot Carry, please come and join us. You will not be sorry. Oh, you will. Yes, you'll be sorry if you actually missed it. Last but not least, we will be having our 126th annual session in Greensboro, North Carolina during the summer during our summer months, which is August 14th to the 17th. We look forward to having you in the place. Last but not least, before we bring on our guest tonight, if you have any comments or questions, please drop them, them in the chat. We are on Lot Carry uh, Wise Facebook page, which is a private group, and we're also on Lot Carry TV on YouTube. Now, let's bring on our guest, and that is the Reverend Emmett L. Dunn. Good evening. Good evening, Reverend Dunn. It is extremely a pleasure to have you here tonight, extremely. So I'm going to say to those people who are paying attention, if you are watching us on uh, the Facebook page, please click that link because we're using StreamYard. We don't want to call you Facebook user. We want to actually identify you by name. Those people who are going to drop comments and questions, let us know where you're coming from so we can engage you in the conversation because it's a it's always a, a tough and tenuous conversation, but with your conversation as being a part of it, it's going to make it even more exciting. Now, the last thing, Reverend Dunn and I are wearing black because it is Thursday and it is Thursdays in black. We celebrate and we uplift and we stand for the eradication of gender-based violence across the world. And so every Thursday, wherever you are, if you can don black and you can let other people know that gender-based violence is wrong, you will be standing with us and we look forward to you doing that. Reverend Dunn, we are in for the conversation. Now, on the first of the of the year, which was January 1st, you were the first person to be our leader, to lead our morning meditation. You gave an amazing meditation on a woman who sometimes gets sent to the background, gets silenced. And other women like her, unfortunately, sometimes are in the same position. Would you please give us a little bit of a recap of what you spoke about that will lead us into our conversation tonight? Well, good evening first to you and uh, to all of those who are watching um, by way of whatever medium you're using. And let me just uh, congratulate uh, women in service everywhere, especially our president, the Reverend Dr. Angelia Clifton and her uh, highly effective team for all that you continue to do for and with Lot Carey. And indeed, tonight is, is a privilege for me to, to be with you. And I hope that this conversation uh, will inspire us to be better people uh, at the end of the day. 
On the first um, day of this year, January 1, we were privileged to share with you uh, our meditation. And I lifted up the, uh, the story of uh, Haggai. Haggai actually represents for me um, uh, a story of a woman who was basically misused and in my opinion was seen as a uh, disposable uh, product. And sometimes we hide behind the Bible to uh, enable um, the misinterpretation of human history as played out in the Bible. And so my intent when I did the meditation was to kind of turn on the light on, on Hagar, not just as a story in the Bible, but a story that happened to a real African girl um, by a patriarch of the faith, Abraham. And somehow we tend not to call it for what it was at the time, and, and the way I read scripture, I see it as abuse. And I was using the story of Hagar uh, to, um, to share the light on what's going on today in the 21st century. As the story of Hagar uh, is not a story of history. It's really a story of today. So that was the intent for using Hagar as the backdrop for our conversation a couple of days ago. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you for the people who are starting to roll in some comments, those people who were a part of that meditation and heard it. Please, if there's something that you remember that you want to throw into the conversation for this evening, please do so. And I'll do the best I can to either lift it or to read it. So we have a few, a few uh, noticings and wonderings. There are women today who, as in yesteryear, are still considered property. Uh, we've definitely made a number of strides, no matter the uh, historical background, not necessarily the, uh, the, the racial connotations, but just in terms of being female. It wasn't so long ago that we had to look to the males in our life in order to purchase land, in order to uh, established businesses it was not, but maybe a hundred years ago when we couldn't even vote. And so we've made great strides, but with the strides that we've made, there are also a lot of obstacles that we still have to go. In the corporate sector, we are still underpaid when it comes to, um, let's say rising the corporate ladder. There are times that we're still overlooked. Sometimes even being or raising a family, we are told to make the choice of how long we work or how much we can work, therefore how much we can earn, even though depending on the circumstance, we might be leading the family by ourselves. And so as we have made certain strides, there's still a lot of things that mm, tend to hold us back. Sometimes it's women themselves. And in this story, it wasn't just Abraham, but Sarai had a little bit to do with the holding of her sister, if you will, holding her back. Let's get into the conversations for this evening. After hearing the morning meditation that you shared, can you say a little bit more about how the church intentionally or unintentionally can send or even push folks away, which in essence silences them, like Hagar was silenced. Well, thank you for the question. And um, I think it grieves all of us to even put this question within the context of the church. Uh, because when we speak of church, we, we usually use the cliche of uh, the arc of safety. Hmm. And uh, I think it's paradoxical to to talk about uh, 
exclusion in the arc of safety. Uh, but the fact that the question is raised um, means that it has some foundation in reality. And um, you made reference to corporate America, you made reference to uh, politics, you made reference uh, to the workplace. But I have to be quite honest with you. I think the worst uh, place that I see uh, women relegated to the back is really within in the church. And um, I say that with, with a heavy heart uh, because we are all product of, of the church. And when we speak of exclusion as it relates to, uh, to, to female and our mothers, our grandmothers, our, our sisters, we have to be real and, and really speak to ourselves because I think it's somehow hypocritical for us to call corporate America on the carpet when in fact uh, we worship and celebrate in the context where even in the midst of our celebration, uh, we are experiencing exclusion. So um, there, there, there's to some extent there are, there are churches and, and normally when you speak of such issues, uh, we make general general statements, but we know that there are churches and 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 a good number of lot carrier churches of uh, that today have crossed that hurdle and now celebrate the you know the ministry of women and celebrate the leadership of women. Lot carry uh, as as a missional community uh, has made history by naming the first female president in 125 years, uh, and and so. I, I think we are leading in, in this area. However, however, uh, the truth still remains that our, our sisters are experiencing a sense of uh, get behind until it's your time in some of our churches. And, and to answer your question directly, I think one of the ways that the, the church continues to uh, hold women in their place is by using scripture. Sadly to say that the very Bible that, that we hold as the, 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 uh, the manual that revealed God into human history, it's the same one that we use to hold people, you know, in the places. So uh, we do that by using scripture. Uh, we do that by not embracing the, um, the dynamism that comes from, from, from these women, the, the ideas, their, their vision, their dreams. Uh, you know, I always say that any pastor, um, uh, that only uh, anyone who calls him or herself a pastor and they feel that they're the only one that God is speaking to, mm. I don't want to be in that church because I believe God speaks to God's people. Now, don't get me wrong. God calls pastors to lead, but God's conversation is not limited to the leader. God shares with us all because we're all, you know, uh, a part of this community. So yes, I, I, I think that there are churches who intentionally uh, use the Bible to put women in, just not women, young people as well, you know. And But also I think another way that the church has conveniently, conveniently uh, kept people in, in the places, in, and especially women, since that's the conversation tonight, is by not even being receptive, you know, mm. to the views or to, 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 to the voice. Thank you for that. Um, something that popped into my into my head, I happen to have been watching a, uh, a documentary um, about the black church and there are a couple and somebody knows or can look this one up, drop it in the chat. I'd, I'd be very grace, uh, gracious about that. <clears throat> and it spoke of uh, in, our, in our black church history, uh, the itinerant preacher. And how the itinerant preacher, you know, may, let's say, rotate between, let's say, four churches or four communities across the month. And it didn't hit me until I was approximately this age that I said, well, wait a minute, what happens during the other three weeks? And in this documentary, it spoke of how the women in the church are the ones that hold it together until that itinerant preacher may come. Not that they're the only people, but the other thing that popped into my head or from this conversation was 
when churches are started or when they are raised literally and figuratively, the community does come together to put it together. But in this documentary, it spoke of how it's a lot of the women who uh, will, let's say, do the food drives in order to raise the money, in order to get the church together. When they literally raise the church up, yes, it's the men and the women. The women are doing like a lot of different type of work to get the structure together. But then the internal workings of it, whether it's the decorating and yes, that can be done, but the internal workings of it, I said, wait a minute. And I think it was the book talk. And so Dr. Angelita, I know that you're, um, that you're watching. And so if it is from the book talk that we did, please drop the book. If it wasn't for the women, I think it's if it wasn't for the women. And in this, in this text, it talked about how um, it's the women who will take the new preacher that's coming in and in essence, kind of school them, kind of say, so listen, see that sister over there? Make sure that, you know, you make sure you go visit her and her family because she's like a heavy hitter, if you will, in the church, right? She's part of the foundation. And so in that light, hearing how they may stand up at the door and be a part of the door, but they can't come down the aisle and be a part of the actual programming of the church is sometimes, you know, as you, as you're speaking about, it's sometimes like a hard pill to swallow. Let's move on to, to the next one. Actually, uh, we have a little a comment from the, so it says, amen, leaders expressing misinterpreted scripture holds women back in many churches. Yes, thank you, uh, Facebook user. So any other comments or questions, please drop them in the chat and we will definitely put them up as part of the conversation. So as a former pastor, to what degree would you say that the art of silencing folks contradicts the gospel message as it relates to the quality of our relationships? You can't be a student of the New Testament or a follower of the teachings of Christ and not see that any attempt to silence anyone in the church uh, contradicts the gospel message of come all of you into the barnyard of God. Christ's message, it, you know, the New Testament is replete. Uh, whether it was the, the woman caught in so-called adultery or it was uh, the woman washing his feet or whether it was him stopping to, uh, to kill the woman with the issue of blood, Christ was always, or uh, the most relevant one is speaking at the woman at the well, with the woman at the well. There are all of these examples where Jesus, uh, understanding the social political uh, structure of his day was basically a uh, revolutionary in terms of saying to Judaism that for all of these years, you have subjected women to the back of the kitchen. Now it's about time I bring them to the front of the house. And, and we all know, uh, those of us who are uh, students of the Bible, we know that uh, the Jewish culture did not elevate the status of women. But Jesus, in the midst of, and we all know Jesus was a Palestinian Jew, so he was not outside of his religious context. He was just transforming his context uh, to the point where he was elevating the status of women. So the, the, the thing here is we talk about this room at the cross which is something we sing about, we shout about, we preach about. So I, 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 I am convinced and I am sure that there is room at the cross. My question tonight is, is there room at the table? We preach about room at the cross, but is there room at the table, many, uh, when we preach for people to come to faith in Christ? Do we just keep them at the foot of the cross? Or do we make space, widen the tent for them to be part of what we're doing? So, so um, that, that, is, that is primarily my question, you know. 
So I know there's room at the cross, but is there room at the table I you know, like for that. our sisters, for our young people? You know, so that's that's what we have to wrestle with. You know, creating mm -hmm. space because after the cross, then what? It's not heaven. We all have to work, you know, and engage in 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 in, in mission and ministry down here to make this world a better place. So the question really is, when I have occupied that space at the cross, what else is left for me? Hmm. I like that. Someone has to type that in, in the chat. Stream team, get ready. There's room at the cross, but is there room at the table? I like that. Um, thank you for sharing that. Um, actually, I want to put this back up. Thank you so much, Dr. Clifton. It, the text is, If It Wasn't For The Women by Cheryl Townsend Gilks. She discusses the intentional and unintentional oppressive systems in the church. Thank you. And oh, so here is um, a statement. Thank you again. That the longest recorded conversation with Jesus happens actually with the woman at the well. Excellent. Thank you. And thank you uh, for the person who typed that in. Yes, they were gonna, you're going to hear uh, lots of gems, as I call them, during this conversation. And so if you hear them, please drop them in the chat and then we'll pull them up because sometimes we have structured things that we want to say as a part of the conversation, um, but there are things that just sort of flow. And when those things flow, we don't want to miss them. And so it's another layer of um, reinforcing the good things that we hear, the aha moments, or some will say in the church, that will preach. That will preach. There's room with the cross, but is there room with the table? Thank you very much for that. Let's go on to our next question. So how do you believe that religious leaders, pastors, can combat the intertwining of sexism and gendered racism to create a safe and sacred space instead of sometimes the toxic place that we have in the church? I, I really think there, there are two, two basic things. One is mutual respect. You know, and, and I say mutual respect because uh, respect comes from uh, a deeper place within in the human soul. Right? Because in order for me to, to respect you, and I'm not using the word tolerate, because tolerance and respect are two different things. As Christians, we are not called to tolerate each other. We are called to respect that leads to acceptance. Right? And, and the word I like to lift up to, to describe uh, the sentiments I'm trying to share it, is the word from South Africa that, that is called Ubuntu. It's a concept. Right, a word that, 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 that embodies a concept of Ubuntu, which means I am because you are. Not I am because of you, but I am because you are. In other words, when I see you, I see me. And I think if we were to embrace that, 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 that culture, that concept of Ubuntu within the context of the church, we will have a much healthier uh, Christian uh, community because uh, mutual respect leads to uh, us sitting down and talking together, reasoning together, listening together, embracing together. When we talk about, you know, uh, I'm going to cry when you cry, or I'm going to uh, uh, smile when you smile. You cannot do those things outside of the bonds of respect because respect put us on the same level playing field. And I believe that in order for the church to, uh, to uh, remodel herself uh, to the place where all of us can find that space where we can exercise our God-given gifts to the point where we believe that we are making a contribution no matter how little or no matter how much, but that everyone is valued. And I'm not valued because I'm an usher. I'm not valued because I'm, you know, the fifth Sunday missionary in a white dress. No, I'm valued because I'm made in the image and likeness of God. And if it's my place to be an usher, fine. If it's my place to be uh, just on the mission committee, fine. 
But if it's my place to be in the pulpit, that should also be fine. And so uh, in our, we should not design or create categories based on gender. We should create categories based on gifts and skills, no matter who possesses them. And, and so I, I, I say, you know, in order to, to, to create a healthier uh, Christian community, we must uh, be able to uh, mutually respect each other with a view of accepting us, no matter who we are, no matter where we come from, no matter our uh, social economic background. But what matters is because red, yellow, black, and white, we're all precious in the sight of God because we're all made in God's image and life. You brought up a, a phrase that I have to reiterate. So I, one of my, one of the titles that I have had in the church is as an usher, the doorkeeper. And at every usher's meeting, which is every Sunday, we would say, our closing statement would be what? And some of you who are ushers out there, you know what I'm about to say. If every usher were just like me, what would this usher board be? And taking that into the context of if every member of the church was just like me, if every person who's on a board, who's on a group, who's in a mission, who's in the Sunday school, who's in the choir, who's you know in the the the, the, um, the kitchen ministry, who's in the pew ministry, who's the outreach ministry, the evangelist, everybody, the people who work in the church office, if they were just like me, would people want to come in? Would people feel safe? Would they feel that it's a toxic place? Or would they feel that they are heard and they are seen and that they are not pushed aside like Hagar was? They are not shunned like Hagar was. They're not tossed. They're not manipulated for your own, ooh, that's a word right there, in order to make your position or your role in the church something different, that you have to do something different to other people. Thank you. Thank you for that. So share your thoughts. Oh, this is a real, a real interesting one. So share your thoughts about what this toxic environment says to our children, because we're creating legacy. We're creating the next generation. We're nurturing, we're guiding, we're developing them. But what does this type of environment say to our children about masculinity and femininity? So I want to really redirect us to the conversation about Hagar and the relationship between Hagar and Sarai and Hagar and the rela relationship between Hagar, um, Hagar and Abraham. So if children are a product of their environment, how does this impact the ways that emerging leaders can understand equity and equality? So it's kind of two, two questions, equity and equality but also how does this impact our children? Well, there's good news and bad news. Um, the good news is that the church is no longer the, uh, the black church, let me be specific. The black church is no longer the epic center of the black community anymore. Hmm. We've lost that. Say that again. We're no longer the epic center of the black community anymore. All right, with the with the rise in access uh, to social media and uh, uh, multimedia and the arts and the theater and the Hollywood, our kids have been exposed to all different kinds of, of of human relationships. So that's the good news. All right, the bad news is that the role of the church in in, in, in social development, the rule of the black church, in social development, all right, have gone by the wayside. And so what we are producing now, we are producing a whole generation who even if they found themselves in the church, it's not being influenced only by the church. They've been influenced by the extended cultures I've mentioned earlier. Right? Notwithstanding, notwithstanding, uh, the church continues to, uh, to display uh, 
uh, that that uh, separation between male and female. And let me let me let me be very clear, very clear that I believe that male and female are not the same. We are not the same. We are not created the same. We biologically were not the same. Uh, a male is a male. A female is a female. Physiologically, we are different people, all right? However, our differences should not create uh, uh, a space for exclusion or I am greater or better. We are different because God created us uh, because God has a plan for the male and the female. But we are gifted the same. Uh, we have the same qualities. We have this, the same intellect. Uh, the male is not better than the female, and the female is not better than the male. Um, and, and so I, I say this because we can dilute the conversation. And rather than celebrate uh, our our created nature, we use that to divide us, right? And, and, and so what I see that could be happening, especially based on the question that, that you pose, is, is that young people who grew up in the church, let's, let's talk about young, young girls, our young daughters, our nieces, that grew up in the church and would never see, you know, a female deacon. Hmm. or a female pastor, or a female chair of trustees. That's a problem. Back in the day, yeah, that, that yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's a problem. That's a problem. And, 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 and so that's the way that, that a church could perpetuate the, the male domineering leadership within the context of the church. But again, because these young people are exposed, and in some instances overly exposed, um, they can look back in recent history and, 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 and know that there was a Hillary Clinton that ran for president of the United States. Okay. They can, they can look back and say Nancy Pelosi that, that, that just turned over the gavel, even though there's no one to receive it just yet, you know, as speak of the house. All right. They can look at uh, a Linda Greenfield, African-American sister, who's now the U S ambassador to the United Nation. They can look at uh, 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 Michelle Obama, you know, the first sister to be first lady. So, so they can see it now. And so their, their idea of women leadership and women aspiring to, to do great things is not limited to women in the church. Right. So that's the good news. So I'm, I'm not overly concerned, to be quite honest with you, uh, that the church is, is, is will, will kind of handicap our young. I'm not overly concerned about that. Because our young people are smart enough to see through that hypocrisy. So they're, they're smart enough. I'm not, I'm, right. to be honest with you, I'm, I'm not overly concerned about that at all. I, I'm, I'm interested in the response that, let's say the older church members and however you count older, um, when a young person does come and say, so where is the place for women in this area of the church or church leadership. And there are still some, and I'm going to bring up some uh, comments that came through that are related to this. And they're still a part of, um, let's say the old entourage that says, well, you know, we believe that women need to be in these roles and men are in these roles. And those young people press, they press the conversation it's easier today when the pressing comes and the responses are not like, well, you know, it's the way we're doing it. Because at the same moment, those young people can sort of turn on their heels and just walk out the door. So but now, right, right. What I'm saying. And so now we're at a, we're at a, we're at a junction where those conversations are, we kind of need to listen and we need to respond differently and we need to make space. And so I'm very thankful for Lot Carey and, and uh, some of the churches that are actually represented here who have already made uh, statements or um, who show up as representatives of, of um, churches that have made space for women in a number of different uh, areas. 
So I want to I want to bring up something. Uh, thank you, BC Carter. Many of our churches were started by women through prayer bands in the homes. Anybody's family remembers a prayer band? If you do, drop it in the comments. Maybe it's your grandmother, your great grandmother, or you know, someone someone of that generation. So now we're in the church building celebrating anniversaries. Ooh, not acknowledging the history that the founder was a woman. Well, yeah, yeah, yes, the truth of the matter. You know, yes, the truth of the matter. We have male pastors because women made us pastors. Oh, wait, wait. Say that again. Say that again. All of us who are pastors, who were privileged to be pastors, Go back and count the vote. Go back and count the vote. So yes, the point I'm making, the point I'm making is that uh, our mothers, our sisters have given us that respect over the years. They've given us that respect. They've appreciated our leadership. To some extent to their own exclusion. Mm, yes. But we should not manipulate the kindness, which I think we've done over the years. Amen. And use scripture to brainwash them. They've respected us. They've given us a privileged position. To some extent, at their own exclusion. Mm. But we should not use that to manipulate them, which I think we've done over the years. Thank you for that. Here's a, another comment. We still have to bring a folding chair to the boards in some churches. So that comes from the from Shirley Chisholm. If they won't give you a seat at the table, <laughs> bring your own folding chair. And yes, uh, there are still some uh, houses of worship that are still, you know, not allowing you to sit at the table. But and, and let me just let me just also say this on behalf of the women I know. Yes. And churches need to understand, our sisters are not clamoring to be pastors. That's not what they're fighting for. They're just fighting for their rightful place in the context of this arc of safety. Because you talk to some brothers and you think all our sisters want to do is just be, that's, I talk to a lot of women all over this country. Everyone is not called to be pastor, but if they are called, then we expect them to be given a chance. So I just wanted to drop that in because Thanks. I think when we ever have these conversations, people think that all our sisters want is just to be the next lead pastor. And to be honest with you, most of them, some of them with PhD degrees from major theological institutions, they don't want to have anything to do with the pulpit, not because they don't respect it, mm -hmm. but because they don't feel called or right. led to it. So all our sisters are saying is that give us that space that we believe God has called us to. And it may not be in your pulpit. You know, it may not be on your board. It just might be a leader for committee, you know, for crying out loud. All right. But don't, don't make that determination for me. Create an atmosphere where if I want to sit and do nothing, I sit and do nothing. That if I believe that God is calling me uh, to, to lead, to lead a part of what we believe that God has called all of us to be and to do, then by God, let me, let me, let me do that. Excellent. Thank you. I'm going to bring up some of the comments as we uh, round this out. So thank you, Dr. Clifton uh, in Gosa, and I said it right, Gosa. Ubuntu is the belief and philosophical perspective of our universal bond as human beings. Thank you so much, Reverend Douglas Moore. Until the church deals with its Pauline ethic, which allows for exclusivity and sexism, we will continue to lose people. Thank you. Um, here's another comment. Amen. Socially constructed identities should not define how we serve in the kingdom. So you can be male or you can be female, but it should not necessarily say that because you are one or the other, you have to be in on this side of the aisle. 
All right, here's another. Here we go. Smart enough to see through the hypocrisy. Yes, thank you for dropping that that gem again. This is why many people have left the church. Mm. And last comment so far is we sisters. There we go. We sisters just want to be included. Titles are not necessary. Yes, with that. <laughs> right. Some of it, everybody's right. Everybody's not called to to be to be the head or to be the leader. But if I can make a decision pertaining to the financial status and so allow me to be on the trustee board or allow me to be some churches are making decisions that there is there will no longer be a, in the diaconos, right, a deacon and a deaconess, that there are deacons. I'm just saying some people are having that conversation. Uh, these are the comments that we have so far. Let me just check one of our other platforms. Sir, if you want to give some final comments, or I think another one is popping through. Here we go. It is popping through on my phone. Women must accept accountability for their roles, good and not so good, in the church. Thank you for that. I'm up here. Right. It's only coming up on one platform. Excellent. Sir, any final thoughts? This has been a very rich conversation. Well, I just want to again express my thanks. Uh, I hope I have not offended anyone, but, uh, uh, you know, these are hard conversations to have. These are not easy conversations to have. Um, and obviously, everything I said, someone could give a, a, a counter position, and I understand that. But, uh, uh, but I just want to thank you for creating the opportunity for us to be able to share on, on this platform. And I hope that uh, the little we were able to, to, to say tonight uh, will, will cause you to think because it's not telling you what to do or how to do, but it's just saying now, it may be time to rethink what you may have thought of back then. And you may think about it and come to the same old conclusions, but the fact of the matter is I have stared up something within you that caused you to rethink all thoughts. Uh, but it's my prayer that uh, that the church of God will, will evolve to the place where we would be like Jesus. You know, that, that you know, whether you're um, a male or female, a Jew or Gentile, it's the same scripture that says what in Christ, there is no east or west, no north, no south nor male, nor female, you know, we are all one. You know, we belong together because we belong to Christ, you know, and if Christ had the audacity, you know, to, to break tradition by speaking with a woman in public and by touching a woman in the, in the process of healing her, you know, then who are we? Hmm. Who are we not to embrace God, God's people, uh, no matter who they are. So again, thank you. And I, I pray God's blessings on us, and I hope that uh, the remaining of these conversations that we will uh, partake in, you know, every month Amen. throughout this year, will will build up on what we've started, and will will help us to to cultivate a culture of inclusion and acceptance. Excellent. So we actually have two more. Uh, so let let me put this up. So thank you. To we will work to deconstruct to reconstruct. New theologies. Excellent. Here's um, actually, I guess, one. I'll final. Let me give this comment. So these are hard conversations. Thank you so much, Sister Robin Joseph, but very much needed. More eyes and ears need to be open. And that's what Lot Carry Women in Service Everywhere, what we intend to do during these digital couch conversations. Thank you. So here's actually a final question. And that is how do you see Dr. Stewart's role as president? impacting the global community as it relates to leadership? Well, I, I, I think, I think um, it's a wonderful opportunity for, for us uh, to have uh, such a dynamic person. Uh, Dr. Stewart is a good human being. She's a good person, not because she's president or not because she's pastor. She's just a downright good human being who just happened to be called 
to lead like Carrie at such a time as this. And um, women in leadership across the globe is no longer a new phenomenon, all right? On the continent of Africa, we've had at least two female heads of states. So that's the highest you can get, all right? So that's not a new phenomenon now. However, women in leadership in the church is a new phenomenon, all right? And, and that's why I think your question is very relevant, all right? Because I can assure you there are places that Dr. Stewart will go that she would not be embraced. I can tell you right now. We already there know are places that, that Dr. Stewart will go that she would not be embraced. And trust me, those places are right here in these United States. Mm -hmm. They are right here in this country. Mm -hmm. Land of the free and home of the brave. All right. But well, not notwithstanding, 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 the ascendancy of Dr. Stewart to the position of president of Lord Carey uh, has caught on in, in, in I'm privileged to serve as EST. And so because of that role, I get to travel and everywhere I've been around the world, all right, that has come up as a commendation to who we are as a faith community. And so they are seeing the step that Lord Carey has taken, right? Understanding that Dr. Stewart was not a token, but she is a bona fide, genuine, effective, efficient leader. One who I priv I'm privileged to call my partner in this, uh, in this ministry in leading Lord Carey. So yes, uh, her leadership role has been appreciated. Uh, around around the world. She and I were just in Liberia and, and Ghana yeah. and she was hailed as as our president, you know, and, and so she was given all of the, you know, accommodation befitting of a person in that role, which made me proud uh, to be a son of the continent and to see us embracing uh, a Christian woman leader. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. We thank you, Reverend Dunn, for your outstanding leadership. Yes, I think we can all give the the, the clap and the, the heralds because you are doing an outstanding job as our leader and all that you do, yes, for the women in the church through supporting the women in service everywhere and all of our efforts for our our, our monthly prayer calls for what's going to come up in, in March, our 31 days of prayer, for our book studies, for uh, our, our our double Dutch, you know, competition, all the things, all the initiatives that we are trying to think and grow and love outside of the box in order to reach the least of these within our own communities and outside of our walls and across the state and the country and the world. We thank you for being at the helm and, and making sure that when we ask, you give the, the appropriate nod to say, go ahead. Because you know that we're coming from a good heart, a good place. And we, when we rise, the entire community rises. And so we thank for you, you for your support. Uh, as we wrap up, we thank you so much for everyone in the community for being a part of uh, this conversation tonight. We have one last comment. Thank you, Reverend Dunn, for your kind, consistent, and spiritual leadership. We want to just remind you of the things that are coming up. Please, please, please join us on the first day of the month for our monthly prayer call and then the first Thursday of the month for our Women in Service Everywhere Digital Couch. Once again, in March, we will be having our uh, spring conference, which is March 16th to the 17th in Alexandria, Virginia. Please be on the lookout. Those of you who know what to do, you know what to do. Come on over, come on down and come on and come on and see us at the spring conference. And then, of course, our 126th annual session, which is going to be in Greensboro, North Carolina. We will be having our annual session, which is August 14th to the 17th. So we thank you so much. My name is Doria Larrier. I'm the host of the Digital Couch here at Women in Service Everywhere, our esteemed leader, Reverend Emmett L. Dunn has been our guest tonight, uh, delving into a very deep topic about gendered racism. And we're very thankful for his comments and we look forward to seeing you again. So peace and blessings. 
We will see you next time. Good night.